so we've come to the final session and we're going to bring back Sue and Andrew. And whilst um, I've got the screen up there with a poll, which might look a little bit familiar, it's yesterday's poll on the role of MBS in class two buildings, um, which was discussed during the reform panel. And many of you said you wanted a fourth option to that question. So we've reframed it. It's up there. Please answer the poll as we get Sue and Andrew ready to come back in now to do Q&A. Now, we've had lots of questions. We've done our best to capture some of those from this morning into the Q&A slides that we'll show today and we will um, the VBA will send out answers to a broader range of questions in the post conference communication so if your question's not answered in the next 15 minutes or so um, please look out for that communication post conference where the VBA will try to get back to all of you so um, we're about to share screen on the uh, the first question for Sue and Andrew. There's Andrew, just uh, waiting for that to come through. I can't see that polling result there either, but I, I got to um, be a bit gentle with the producer. There's a bit going on there. Um, okay, so there's our polling result. We've got a lot of you who don't want MBSs involved at all. Um, and should I say, I say the reason why that fourth option wasn't there in the first slide is because we were actually talking about a reform that is proposed that will occur. So it's a question of if the MBS comes back in, what's their role going to be? But nevertheless, you asked to have a no option and there it is. All right, let's move through now to the the questions and I've got Sue and Andrew on the screen and we're going to run through these um, pretty efficiently. So Sue, do you want to uh, take this on or is Andrew going to take it on? Happy to take it, Bronwyn. I mean, I think the heart of this question, thank you, is about uh, efficiency and, and the administration of process and identity management. Uh, we are constrained by some provisions where we need to make sure the documentation is current. Uh, but what I can share is we have a project underway as part of government's regulatory reform initiative to tell government once and use it across multiple agencies. So identity management uh, in the future, we're looking to connect with Services Victoria. You would have all used Services Victoria app through COVID uh, and we're building a partnership with Services Victoria for building and plumbing practitioners where uh, you'll have a much better portal over time. Okay, next question. I can take this one if you like. Um, um, so yeah, I, I think this is one that would benefit from a centralised system as well. So um, if we, we had the potential to have things like um, notices and orders, the Section 30s available to uh, all RBSs uh, so they could actually access those uh, and things like performance solutions and other information that's quite valuable on an existing building, then um, that's that's the ideal deal world and something that we're working with um, through through the expert panel to, to deliver those, those things. I think as it stands, um, it, you know, it's not everything is legislated and, um, you know, PBS uh, uh, should be actually approaching the owner as part of that that process to actually ask around uh, whether there are any existing notices and orders on the on the building and um, uh, and then take those in, into account. Um, so. Uh, and Andrew, can I just add to that? I mean, I think we want everyone in the system to have access to the information relevant to them. So, um, you know, it's not just the PBS or the owner, it's the regulator, it's the MBS. In certain circumstances, there'll be other authorities. Um, so that's how I kind of build out of that system we're talking about is we need to collate all the documentation, have it available to those who need it when they need it. And it becomes a fairly powerful tool and uh, a valuable tool. So it, it will create efficiencies. So, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time around resource uh, resources and getting new building surveyors, but it, it really is that other perspective that we look at, need to look at more is what can we do to make um, uh, our job easier and um, uh, less, less input, uh, more time to do the uh, critical things. Next slide, thanks. Um, I think the first part of this question we're going to have to take on notice. So just for the purposes of this um, session, can we focus on the second part? How, what's the process with practice notes and why is this uh, attendee saying that they're not becoming aware when there are new ones? Yes, I think currently it's probably a bit sporadic. It is um, uh, through sort of our normal comms with practitioners and through newsletters. Uh, it is an area that's um, uh, been raised as part of our current um, 
improvement program on practice notes and our stakeholder engagement. Uh, so we will be improving that that piece uh, moving forward. I think um, uh, ideally we will have a digital solution for that as well. So um, it, it will be hopefully eventually um, a, a matter of um, automated uh, alerts a registration process for uh, the practice notes once you access them and then a um, an alert that goes out based on uh, any any changes that are made on that practice note. Um, but there will be a lot of change, hopefully, over the next 12 months uh, with the practice notes and updates. So I think it's going to be um, sort of a, a bulk notification at a, a monthly um, monthly sort of uh, cycle and, and depending on the importance of the practice note, it may, may be through a uh, all-practitioner um, email. Okay, next slide. I'll, I'll take this one, Bron. Um, uh, I feel like half my job is advocating for everyone in the system to have uh, good resources or adequate resources and commensurate skills. You know, if the system, every part of the system is resourced appropriately, that's where we're going to get the best results for the system, for the industry and the consumers. Uh, in terms of councils, when I meet CEOs of councils, uh, I do advocate uh, on behalf of the building department about and talk about the importance of a well-resourced and a highly competent building department. I encourage them to think about it like they think planning, so connecting the building and the planning together because the planning is the first part um, of the system. In terms of um, VBA being, held, uh, being able to hold councils to account, I don't have a remit and legislation for that. Um, I'd really love to see uh, through the expert panel uh, how um, this will be addressed and I think the, the municipal building control plans etc go to part of this um, but you know a key question is a time for councils to be also publicly reporting on their building department activity to support um, the really you know importance of that building department as they go about their work. Okay, next slide. And I can take that one. Thanks, Bron. Um, so uh, really uh, under the legislation currently, yes, there is a, a requirement for that reporting if the builder doesn't um, notify of inspections. Uh, the requirement where uh, they've undertaken work um, prior or without uh, the issue of the, the permit, um, uh, that should be dealt with uh, via the uh, enforcement process from the building surveyor and um, uh, that then gets escalated uh, to the VBA if it's un unresolved. Um, so, yeah, that's basically the process at the moment. There's probably nothing um, stopping a complaint to be made if that's occurring uh, yeah. quite often so that we get uh, more vision uh, within the VBA of uh, poor practices from from practitioners. And, uh, and I think our data piece uh, you know, is getting more sophisticated, so those sort of complaints will feed into our, our data system and provide a better vision of uh, the practices of, of individual practitioners so it builds that uh, picture and uh, uh, and allows us then to target our um, efforts in, in future. Okay, next slide. Okay, we've had uh, somebody wants to put their hand up to go and speak at Melbourne Polytechnic and we have reached out to them and we will let you know in the post-conference material how you can get more involved um, following that call to action yesterday afternoon. Next slide. And there's the answer to this one. What percentage of those who enrolled in the program are still enrolled, all of them? Uh, so 100% uh, follow through on that. Next slide. What oh, the VBA is doing on orphan permits, Sue. Yeah, I can take this one. I mean, obviously, a bit of discussion yesterday. Uh, it's something that we've prioritised resources to, um, uh, you know, increasingly over recent times. I think from a, we've taken a risk space focus initially, uh, that has been about really trying to help the facilitation and transfer of the functions where building projects are underway. And I, I am really pleased to say there have been many projects picked up and, and building surveyors willing to do um, this work, which is really an important piece um, for the consumer who gets stuck in the middle. Um, we have been talking with the expert panel about the best system as a whole response and, and their piece of policy design work as well. How do we put the consumer at the heart of this? We talked about yesterday some of the issues 
uh, including consumers being um, really disgruntled, reasonably so, that they have to pay for the services again. Uh, in terms of the VBA, well, we do have the statutory manager powers. We are expecting to put out a policy position on that uh, in the near future. Um, but I would suffice to say, you know, in accordance with the second reading speech, it's really about a last resort um, provision. So we really want as much as we can to work with the system. There's, there's a question of who's going to fund that, uh, that function as well. Um, and we think it would be really about where there was material major economic disruption um, where we needed to step in, similar to kind of other, other circumstances we would step in. So, you know, a lot more work for all of us to do to bring to bear a system um, that supports consumers through this. And, and we, um, you know, we're in there working our way with everyone, uh, including councils. Next slide. I think the answer is we did. We continue to do so, and the feedback and questions today have been really valuable, as has the chat. So, um, uh, we basically engaged with a lot of the uh, industry groups um, uh, prior to this. Um, I think in the past we have actually run a, a survey, which we didn't didn't do this year. So that might be something that we can look at um, in in uh, future years. Yeah, we did. We have done that in previous years, but I can also recall that we don't get a lot of uptake, but no reason not to try again next year um, and see with the registration notifications or notification of the date that we ask for feedback while we're developing the program. But uh, yeah, it's it's hard to please everybody, but I've seen great engagement with the topics in the chat. So hopefully, um, you know, there is some some great learning that's come from this conference. And uh, for those who feel it, it hasn't been, then please give us your feedback for the future. And remember that this is one event. Um, there's been a lot of talk today about the broader extrication program that Andrew is responsible for that covers a range of different topics. So um, hopefully, and, and the attendance at those is specs for itself. So hopefully there is some, uh, many of you who are um, positive about the, the topics in this conference and in that program. Next slide. And I can pick that one up. Um, yeah, a bit puzzled with that one now because we, we have been running the practitioner education series on a monthly basis. So, so we had one in February, one in December. Um, Miss January with the, the Christmas break. Uh, this um, conference probably sort of um, takes out one of the the um, normal sessions, and then we've got one in April. Uh, that the question may be sort of um, resulting from the last couple being plumbing practitioner based, so um, not not building. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, we've got limited resources around. Um, uh, how we can actually provide all this education. Uh, and I think you know, a lot of comments uh, that I've read too is around the education requirement for other practitioners other than building surveyors. So it's a, a sort of um, a prioritisation around uh, the different practitioners and the different issues that we've got and uh, who, who sort of gets their turn. But for me, um, it's something we can't do on our own. So it's something that we really need industry support uh, and we will be working more with uh, industry groups around them delivering education that's aligned to the stuff that we're finding through our audits and, and inspections. Uh, so that's something we're developing uh, as our inspection and audit programs uh, develop and we're getting better, better information out of that. We will then be able to communicate more solidly with uh, industry groups and, uh, and make sure that they're communicating the right messages and the right uh, uh, education pieces. So, um, so hopefully it will multiply, but we're definitely um, committed to the education series and uh, suggest you, you look on our website for both past and, um, and future sessions. Okay, Andrew, next slide. Dr. Bromman, just congratulations to Andrew and thank you for the person who gave us positive feedback. Um, really good to see the program has been excellent. So thank you. Okay, next slide. Uh, we've got the answer there. So the question, how many people have issued those 127,000 permits? Just over 400 of the 700 building surveyors have issued them. Do the math. It's a huge amount of pressure on the system. Is, uh, no one can question that. Next slide, please. A few here around registration and the answers are there. So, Sue, did you want to talk to that one? Uh, no, I think it's pretty self-explanatory in terms of, I mean, what you just said, um, Bronwyn, you know, huge pressure on the system. Yes, it has grown, um, you know, to 701, which is an 18% increase, but, you know, it's it's not growing commensurate with demand. Uh, we all know that. There's been discussion yesterday and today. Um, the challenge for us and for government is to address that. 
Okay, and one last slide. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I too am a taxpayer, so I'm absolutely passionate about evidence base of, of the difference that the VBA is making. Uh, so first, as I'd say, we're at early days uh, in the formal evaluation tools. I think if you read uh, some of our reports that we put out in the public domain, uh, we are uh, talking about what we are seeing in terms of shift in behaviour and non-compliance is no longer being seen on site. I know industry talk to me about how they're changing their practices, their production practices, for example, based on the things um, that we are picking up. Um, but as part of our strategy, what we are developing is an outcomes framework. Um, really passionate about being able to show over the longer term how much we've shifted the dial uh, in relation to the outcomes and obviously we're, we're not the only contributor to the successful result there. That will also enable us to go uh, not so at the systems level but also uh, program by program. So we're going to have to make choices between more proactive inspections or less or... Oh, we've lost Sue. Again, um, looks like there's another internet dropout there, but I think the point was made and the fact is the VBA is very concerned about evaluating its performance and its impact and uh, working very hard to create those metrics. Alrighty, we're at the end of the conference now. Thank you very much for hanging on to those of you who are able to be on the scheduled completion time of 2.15. Really appreciate your time. 